and Jay Transit uh, that made that happen. And it was nice for the, us historians to have a hand in it. There were, there were probably a dozen of us uh, that, that had some something to do with all this going on. But Kevin did a lot of the work and a lot of the research and back and forth and painting samples. He was painting two by three foot sheets of steel to make sure, you know, looking at a little one inch swatch or three inch swatch really doesn't do it justice out in the weather. So he was painting big, big sheets of steel that we can hold up and look at and compare with, uh, you know, known stuff. The, the uh, U34 has some places where there's fresh paint on it. We did manage to get uh, through a few friends at General Electric, they sent us the actual original drawings or the original specifications for the U34 CHs. And of course that DuPont paint numbers don't cross to anything today. So um, we had to do it the hard way. Uh, so, so very good, uh, very nice. And um, so, and hopefully, and again, with the success of this, hopefully there'll be more in the future. It's uh, um, excellent. All right, Mike, we're uh, live on Facebook. So whenever you want to uh, introduce our guests. Okay, um, out on the cutoff, there's a lot going on in the news these days, as you've heard, that uh, Amtrak might be coming. And uh, to be honest, this is probably the last best chance of, of, of making it happen. The money's in place, a lot's in place. Um, uh, two people have a, had a, a big part of the roles in New Jersey, uh, and we're going to introduce both of them. Keith Smolin is leading the restoration of the Greendale Station, and Chuck Walsh has been leading the uh, cutoff committee that's been supporting and encouraging politically um, behind the scenes to, to keep the politicians moving forward on this. And, and, and having been part of some of Chuck's uh, events, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at how on board the, the, the politicians are. There's so much, so much political wins in the favor of this thing that it's going to happen. And Pennsylvania is all set to go. When Lackawanna County um, uh, offered to pay for the first study, that made a big impression on Amtrak. And of all the new Amtrak starts, this is the only one that is completely owned by state governments. It's not affected by freight railroads. And it won't be affected by any national strike, which is still being talked about. So um, Chuck Walsh has been a longtime friend of Tri-State. He's done a, a whole lot with us and for us. And we'd like to introduce Chuck and Keith Smolin. Um, so let's let's go. Okay, thanks, Mike. I'm actually going to take it first here. Then Chuck's going to take the second half of it. So I'm going to just go ahead and share my screen up here. And Keith, well, I got you. I wanted to thank you for uh, helping work out with the, the DLNW Historical Society a couple of weeks ago with their symposium. Yeah. I apologize. I, I had a family emergency that morning. Like, just, uh, it was just a, <laughs> but I, 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 I was thankful, okay. th thankful, thankfully, uh, it wasn't too bad and it worked out. But I want to thank you for inviting me I mean, and, uh, and to tonight as well. And Richie. What um, what I was really thrilled with, I, it's the first time I've been to Greendale since you've done all that work. And the, the work is amazing. It's just the station looks terrific and the grounds look terrific. It's safe. Um, it's, you know, interest. It just did a beautiful job. And the interior of the station was nice to see again, too. The original tile floor is still there. So uh, excellent. excellent. Well, thank you. And, and uh, I'm glad you enjoyed the visit out there. And we still have a lot of work to go, though, as you saw, I'm sure. But we're getting there slowly, but surely. Can everyone see my screen? Is this uh, good here? Is everyone good? It looks okay. So uh, looks again, thanks to uh, Mike and to Richie and everyone at Tri-State. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Greendell, and then I'm going to hand it over to Chuck, and uh, he'll take it with the Amtrak and the more modern uh, with the stuff that's going on with the rebuilding and the and uh, the stuff along those lines. So uh, my name is Keith Smolin, and uh, this is a little history of the Lackawanna Cutoff Historical Committee, and we are found on Facebook. All right, so if anybody just does a search of the uh, committee, his, uh, Lackawanna Cutoff Historical Committee will come across us if you're not already on there. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm a, I was a history major at William Patterson University, and... Um, graduated a, a long time ago there with a history degree. 
Uh, I've been a teacher of uh, history, English, and in special education since 2005. I've been a member of the Maywood train station uh, since its inception. Actually, that's where I learned a lot of the uh, restoration and how, how to, uh, the ins and outs of it, just watching uh, Ed Kaminsky, who was a, a great leader on, on that project in Maywood. And I've been a member of the uh, Susquehanna Technical uh, uh, Western um, Technical and Historical Society since 1996. Additionally, uh, I've been a presenter for Operation Lifesaver. I've been, I helped out with Toys for Tots a few years ago. Avid rail fan, I take photos, I post them to some of these message boards and Facebook pages uh, when I get out there. I've always had a fascination with railroads and specifically abandoned railroads, like the lot going to cutoff. So the story of our group, um, the Lackawanna Cutoff Historical Committee actually begins with the Johnsonburg train station and which I'm sure many of um, the people viewing tonight are aware of. Uh, in 2007, this station was raised by NJDOT. Uh, this was kind of one of those things where this was done uh, by accident, uh, uh, you know, and it took everyone by surprise. So, you know, having come out of, uh, you know, knowing what I know about trains, the Lackawanna Railroad, the cutoff, realizing that there are only a handful of structures along the cutoff, um, I didn't want to see the same thing happen to Greendale, uh, quite honestly. Blairstown, uh, which is the next station west, is in good shape because there was a, a demolition. Um, company that was working out of there. Now it's, I guess, a dance or a fitness studio or something. So Blair, uh, Blairstown seemed okay. Greendale was very, um, seemed a little shaky. Uh, so as a result of the Johnsonburg station being torn down, I decided to explore the possibility of creating a group in, uh, in hopes of restoring the station and uh, not losing it to, um, you know, to history there and losing it forever. Uh, this is Johnsonburg, for those who uh, don't remember, that's um, the area. I don't have a date on this picture here, but obviously when you have the two track main line, you have the, um, the siding, a couple sidings there. And Greendell, um, very similar in, in style and, um, you know, right down the road. And I didn't want to see it lost. So, oh, this is what Johnsonburg was, looked like in the, a couple of years before it was torn down. Again, very similar to Greenbelt. Abandoned, you know, I guess NJDOT, I don't know what the deal was. Somebody went out there and like I said, um, no use for it. So they just knocked it down, not thinking and to know who gave those orders. So this is what Greendale looked like, you know, in the, uh, you know, 2010 re area, right after they had, there's a road crossing that was just west of the station there. They took it down and it was kind of, uh, you know, uh, with all the brush that was growing, it was very hidden. Um, it was an attractive nuisance, let's say. You had kids going in there. Who knows what they were doing? Graffiti and drinking and who knows. So um, the people in the community really, nobody really, there was one gentleman, uh, Josh Weinstein, who stepped up, but really, no one really bothered, um, you know, they just drove past it and nobody really got uh, involved. And I don't live in Green Township or, or I'm in Bergen County. So I did it as a, uh, you know, with my rail fan knowledge and, and knowing that I didn't want to see this um, gone for good. So 2013, that's when we officially began as a group. That's when I Form the group on Facebook. Uh, and again, this is one of the early shots. If you look closely, the graffiti, there's a lot of curses in there. And uh, it was just a mess, okay? And the road is actually not that far away. It's actually maybe, I don't even know, 200 feet on the other side there, but you can't even see it. It's well hidden. Uh, the DOT put up some signs, but nobody really, uh, people ignored them quite honestly. And so this is kind of where we started right here, 2013. Uh, going back just briefly into the 1980s, this is what it looked like. Uh, by the way, if anybody has any questions about this, 
uh, put them in the chat and um, I'll try to uh, answer them when I'm done with my part of the presentation. But this is what we, this is what it looked like in the 1980s. Um, guy, a developer by the name of Jerry Turco, he actually replaced the roof when Conrail ripped out the tracks. So the roof was kind of in shape. I guess he was going to use it as an office, but he never did. So the roof was kind of rebuilt. And ironically, that's one of our first projects is the roof. But this is what it was look, uh, what it looked like in the, in the, let's say, late 80s. You had a signal bridge there, and that signal bridge is now in Phillipsburg. Um, I guess somebody from the group down there, I guess they thought <laughs> Greendell was going to be next and they wanted the tower. I'm glad they saved it, but hopefully at some point it could be returned. Um, but that's what we were dealing with, um, minus the bridge and minus the signal uh, tower. So um, I'm going to say that I'm not really, the, I, I use social media, but I'm not the best at it. I don't have a TikTok account, but Facebook really um, was the catalyst into to getting this group started here. So it, it definitely was um, good to have Facebook and to utilize it. Uh, and the group was formed to, to preserve, you know, the Lackawanna cutoff, but specifically Greendell. And starting with Greendell, we, we came across a lot of photos. Uh, some people had, I think somebody contacted me with a speeder. Um, other artifacts. And so it started to come together. And, and in, some, in some ways, it was almost like <laughs> too quickly, too fast, because we had to like get everything in order. Uh, if anybody wants to check us out on Facebook, we do have two official pages. The Lackawanna Cutoff Historical Committee, that's our, that's where we, it goes a little bit more into the whole Lackawanna Cutoff. And Chuck is, is great with the historical posts, I think daily, a, a photo on the page. I kind of keep it to the Greendell and together that's a great uh, resource. So if anybody wants to join up, we, we're always welcoming new members. Uh, and if anybody wants to folk, you know, join and help out and more, more of a focal point with Greendell, uh, check out the Greendell Station Museum. Um, and we post our uh, events on there. We meet uh, several times throughout the year. And uh, if anybody wants to get involved, you can more, you know, you can find out, contact one of us through there. So the membership on Facebook, uh, they grew, it actually grew very quickly. People from all over. We have a guy in Iowa uh, on board, all over the Northeast. You know, that's the one thing about social media. You know, you, you, you don't have to be in Sussex County or in Northern New Jersey. Combination of rail fans, local residents and people. It, it kind of did grow. We did get the, the, the people in the community involved. I want to thank Chuck Walsh publicly. He's been a great founding member. He was one of my go-to people here. He's been a very instrumental in helping me with a lot of things, bylaws and, and everything. So I want to publicly thank Chuck for joining and helping out. And, and he'll discuss the Amtrak part, which is going to be very interesting too, uh, you know, to see that come through Greendell and, and transit with Andover. Um, we had Josh Weinstein. He, he literally lived like three houses down and he was a history teacher. He, he um, made a career change. He's now an airline uh, pilot, um, but he would kind of keep an eye on the station. He would, you know, keep an eye on the kids with the dirt bikes and whoever was going in there. And so he's another founding member, Joe Mealy, who's been around with the, you know, URHS and a lot of historical groups worked on the Susquehanna Another founding member, great, does our membership when we have our meetings. Alan Alaco, another engineer. So I want to thank these guys publicly for, for being with us since the beginning. Um, so yeah, that's that's how the group kind of started, the organizers. Uh, the next part, and I'm just going to give you a brief rundown because it's <laughs> a lot of people think it's easy to form a group, but there's a lot of paperwork involved and I learned that and I, I knew a little bit of it from Maywood, but to actually do it, <laughs> 501c3. We want it to be a nonprofit. So with our team in place, um, a lot of paperwork involved with this, uh, incorporating it with the state. And this was done uh, as well in 2013. And we've been official ever since 2013. Uh, now, nothing with this project with Greendell has been easy. It's been a, uh, I want to say it's been a little bit of a struggle along the way. Part of it, and, and the first bullet here, is, is the, the Lackawanna cutoff itself. NJDOT owns that, which many of you guys know. 
Um, they own it from Port Morris to the Delaware Water Gap. Um, as of 2022, who knows if it goes to Amtrak, how that, that works out. So we were dealing with NJDOT on, on getting a lease for the train station in Greendale. And sounds easy. <laughs> Everyone at DOT who I talked to and worked with over the years, love it. Great idea. However, <laughs> it's basically like subleasing a part of a, in a, like a room in an apartment building or an apartment. It's, it's a sublease on a lease. And it was a little difficult to get the wording done. And this took many years, to be honest, to get to, to the lease part. We had to, you know, we had some help along the way from Senator Arojo, uh, but this was a struggle. This really, you know, we had a, a wave of people, you know, in the beginning and, you know, they stuck with us, but this, this part was really frustrating. And then the main issue was the subleasing of the station from the actual cutoff itself. That's the way I... It was told to me several times. I, you know, DOT really doesn't deal with railroads. They're more of the roads. So this was kind of like a nuisance for them, but I was a pain in their butt and they finally got somewhere. Uh, so for years, it was in a holding pattern. I kept, you know, everyone kept asking what's going on. How come there's no work? You know, everyone wants to see stuff. And it was basically because of NJDOT. It was because of this lease issue. Couldn't really move ahead. We were babysitting it. Uh, they knew we were there. They actually thanked us many times for being there because if we weren't there, no, the kids would have still been going in the station and, and who knows what would have been going on. We did get the Sussex County DOT to clear out the, the brush initially. We did get them to do that. And yes, in 2021, we finally got a lease or in this case, it's a license. Um, that's how they worded it. So we signed the lease. Um, it actually took a while since January. That was when we first saw it in the draft. And the person we were dealing with kind of left and the, DO, the, the the attorney general had to sign it. And it took a while just to even get a lease, even though we saw it in January. As of early 2022, we finally got the lease. <laughs> it took a year to get the lease. Uh, government doesn't move quickly all the time. Uh, so it's a new day. We finally had the lease 2022. And you could see from the earlier pictures, we kept the place looking nice. We put a sign up. We have an American flag there. Uh, we, we did a nice job of babysitting over those years. And we wanted to do more. Legally, we couldn't do more. Uh, so what's the goal of this? The goal is to restore this into a train station. We want to feature uh, Lackawanna, Erie Lackawanna, and Conra Conrail artifacts from the time period that this was a railroad. Conrail being <laughs> the short period that they did own it and you know, ripped it up. Sussex County artifacts we want to put in there as well related to the farming uh, industry and just local artifacts in Green Township. And that's kind of what the goal is here. That's what we envision it to be, the picture that's on your screen right now. And that's that's always been the goal. Uh, hasn't been easy to even, you know, to get to where we are today, but that is still our goal there. So what have we been doing? Um, that picture, by the way, is right after they they cleared out the station, the state. <laughs> that was what Sussex County did. Uh, like I said, we've been babysitting it. Um, NJDOT initially cleared out all the vegetation. The, lot, the, the rails would be on the, um, the far side, the other side of the station, away from where this image is. So that's where the tracks would go. Uh, this will be a crossing. And I, I know Chuck will speak to that when Amtrak gets here. There is a tower on the site as well. Um, to the right, looking down, you can't really see it in this picture here, but there is a tower there. Uh, we're not going to be dealing with the tower. We're going to stick strictly to the station just because of the lease and the way it's structured. So we want to just keep it there, but there is a tower there as well. Everyone asks about and this is kind of the what, what it looked like in 2015. There's a Josh Weinstein photo. We try to keep kids out with those barriers. Those are some old road barriers there. Uh, kids would still get in there, though. Obviously, it was not secure. Um, and there's that roof that I talked about earlier. Uh, the roof is, you know, was going on 30 years old now. There's some leaks in the roof. Uh, and I'll talk about that coming up. The fence goes up in 2015. And I want to give another public um, thank you to Steve Kelmer. This, this gentleman has been really, really instrumental in 
uh, the number of hours, the upkeep this gentleman has done. He's a local resident up the road in Newton, um, a rail fan, historian. Uh, he really helped us with some of these these projects. It sounds crazy, but the fence, you know, he 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 really helped us out and, and got this thing going and he maintains the property. So without his long hours and dedication, we wouldn't, it wouldn't look like it, it does today, to be honest. Um, so he really helped us out tremendously. Uh, Greendale gets an address in 2015. All right. So again, slow progress, 2015. Again, this is what we were kind of doing behind the scenes while we were waiting. Maintaining the property. That's what we've been doing. And you'll see different photos in the next couple of slides over the, how the, the brush has been cleared and grass was put in and it looks really nice now. And um, which is why we're able to host people uh, and, and including Mike the other a couple of weeks ago out at the, uh, the station because it didn't look like what it does today even <laughs> a couple of years ago. Uh, the barriers got moved around to keep people out. Uh, we had to cover up the graffiti. Uh, the graffiti was really obscene. Kids just went crazy with the graffiti. Um, but we got rid of it. Uh, and again, this is the stuff we were doing behind the scenes. The group continued to grow. Um, again, we put the banner up. Uh, if anybody wants to join, like I said, check us out on Facebook. And um, it really it really was a social media a group. I know a lot of historical groups in the past, you know, um, you know, grow organically and, you know, but this was a, this was really a, um, an, a social media one that grew and we have held in-person meetings as well. The goal for us would like to get into the station at some point and hold our meetings there. Uh, just West of Greenville, there's some Lackawanna and Conrail did a, a really bad job of, of when they left the area, they just literally cut stuff down and just left it there. This is the old uh, signal interlocking. There was a, a siding through Greendale and they just left it there. And <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> if anybody, you know, uh, takes a walk on the other side, west of the station. And just to give you a perspective, that signal there, uh, there it is again, there's a, a electrical box to go that went with the interlocking right in the guy's backyard across the street. Um, they basically just walked away from this as I saw it. And that's kind of what it looked like in um, 1976. So that same interlocking and area. And if you look closely, like under the bridge, you'll see probably where the third or fourth car is behind the engine to the right, you'll see the um, where the station is there, okay? Uh, interesting that this is so late, 1976, they're doing all this work, which, it was a little surprising to me when I came across this picture, but um, those signal masts, the uh, the boards, they're in the station. I found them in the weeds there. You know, this is like a couple of years ago. I just went for a walk there. And so they just, you know, I'd like to find that telephone box, but uh, that had disappeared, unfortunately. But that would make a nice artifact to complement the station, maybe at some point. So securing the station, that was the next goal in 2016. And Steve helped us out. We boarded up the windows. We got rid of the graffiti. This is inside. Uh, it's kind of what it looks like now, to be honest. We have the windows and, and door areas and baggage door areas all boarded up. Uh, if you were to come by it today from the road, or if you want to contact one of us to come out there, this is what you would see. Again, the, the, the maintenance, the lawn maintenance, all... Um, you know, we thank Steve for his help because it, it wouldn't look like this without him and, and the securing of the, the, the windows. Uh, that's what it looks like now. We did our, our Christmas holidays at the uh, station, put up a wreath, you know, very simple. Uh, we did have electricity. Uh, we uh, ran a lot line to the neighbor, our, the neighbor next door, very helpful. So we did have light at Greendale. I don't know, I, we, there was never electricity when this was a station. Uh, because they stopped using it in, in 1939, no electrical, uh, Sussex County. So this is probably the first time there was ever something done with electric in at the station. Um, and this is where we are into 2017 and 2019. Um, still waiting. Uh, this is what we were waiting for, the lease at that time. But the place looked really, really good. People kept asking, what are you doing? Um, 
we did get a, a, a Sussex County marker installed. That's what we were doing. And this went up in 2020. However, 2020 was a weird year with COVID and this got delayed a little bit as well. So we had our official ceremony. And um, so that is up there currently behind the fence. And you can see that from the road as you pass by Wolf's Corner Road in Sussex County. Again, that's what it looks like kind of from the, the road area. And that's kind of what this, that's what it would look like if you drove past it now. So as of 2022, the station site is clear all the way back to the tower. We have over 2,400 members on our online Lackawanna cutoff page, historical committee page, close to a thousand on our Greendale page. We had to get insurance uh, and that was a, another hurdle, but we got the insurance in place. And we have our bylaws in place, uh, a lot of paperwork, a lot of behind the scenes stuff. The goal is still the same. We want this to be a museum. This is what we would like. You know, this is just, uh, what we'd like the inside to look like. Obviously, Lackawanna style <laughs> benches, uh, replicas. Uh, but this is kind of where we're going with this museum. So as of right now, in the fall of 2022, we are fundraising for a new roof. That roof that you saw that was new in the mid eighties by Jerry Turco and he had it, there's holes in it, um, it's falling apart. We would like to do an original roof with the, the, the original um, tiles. Uh, the company still exists. And uh, it, however, a new original roof would be very costly. So for now, until we get really going with it, rocking and rolling, we wanna kind of get a, just a roof going we want to hook us up to the, we want to get the electricity going and we want to keep up our general maintenance. We're going to be applying for grants in 2023. The grant writing is going to be intense and we'll be completing this um, with other, we'll be competing with other projects. So these grants are not a lock, but we're going to try to go after them in 2023. Uh, and we are hopeful we can continue to preserve and restore Greendale uh, moving forward. So like I said, we're just, we're trying to, that's this was taken not too long ago that's you can almost see the where in the roof that needs to be why we need to do the roof you can see the little patchwork up on top it's starting to go all right and it's going to have to be addressed uh to get in the station uh if anybody here has been out of the gladstone line the far hills station um it's very similar, actually, in, and I like how New Jersey Transit, I was doing a little field research project, and I met Chuck out there. There's a nice restaurant in this, in this station, a um, little cafe. This is sort of like, you know, granted, it's different style with the overhang and everything, but this is kind of what, ideally, if we had an unlimited budget, we would like the, the roof to look like that, and, and you can kind of uh, see what we, we are aiming to do here, okay, with similar with the, the the windows and the doors and the gutters and you know when you start to look at it, it it is it becomes expensive quickly but this is sort of the goal here this is sort of the goal this is what the inside of far hills looks like those are original benches um you know and so they, they maintain this fairly well here but this is again what we would like to kind of where we would like to see our station go in, in Greenville. Very similar. And that, that's the, the future. So if anybody want, would like to donate, and maybe I'll send out the, um, the link to Richie or to Mike, and maybe if they could repost it, any help is appreciated. Uh, I know a lot of people don't trust the online. If you want to send snail, snail mail, uh, I'll, I'll send this presentation over and the, the, uh, we have a PO box in Greendale. Um, any help is appreciated. If you wanted to help donate, uh, that would be great. Uh, and you can always sign up again to the Facebook pages for, our, we're, we're going to have a meeting in November, second Saturday, in November, and we're going to update on uh, what's going on. Uh, so it's kind of ongoing now with the, um, with the fundraising, we are going to do in person as well. We're going to get, I, uh, Someone's going to be Santa, so it might as well be me. Two hours. Uh, we're going to, you know, we've been fundraising mostly online, but this is going to be a good chance to get people from the community involved and really put, um, you know, put a face to who we are at the at the station. Because for many years, it's just been a fence and 
hasn't been open and there's been a lot of stuff, but now this is really our first public event, December 3rd. And, and yes, I'll be Santa. Maybe I'll put on some weight between now and December 3rd. I got about two months. And I want to thank everyone. I want to thank uh, Richie and Mike and everyone at Tri-State for uh, allowing us to, um, allowing myself to present tonight. And if anybody had any questions in the chat, I'll be more than happy to, to take them now. And at this point, I'm, I have concluded my portion of, of the presentation. So if there's any questions, you can fire them away and, and I'll, I'll turn it over. I'll turn it back to, to Richie or Mike or Chuck is waiting in the wings there. I'll let him handle the future of the, uh, the Amtrak and New Jersey Transit. Thank you, well, Keith. Thank you. Great work you guys are doing. Thank you. Were there any questions or? or um, I don't see any that popped up. Okay. Uh, one, one of the interesting things that's coming that if Amtrak starts operating, I think that stretch is going to be 90 miles an hour. Yes. <laughs> High speed. They better nail down that Christmas tree or it's going away with the train. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had one question come in. Is it Greendell or Greenville? Yeah, it's Green. It's Greendell. That was the uh, architect who, who made that, um, who did that for us for your charge. And he got the... Uh, <laughs> Got the town a little off on there. <laughs> okay. yeah, the name of the community was Greensville. And the early Lackawanna photos right after the cutoff was built show the station sign saying Greensville. And then sometime in the 30s, it changed to Greendale. Now, Mike, I had a, I had a question. On it just And then I'll turn it over to Chuck. The, when We were never found an official documentation. The tower when that was last used at, at Greendale and, and when the station like officially closed. Do you have anything about that? Because we we come across um, I'll, different things. <laughs> I'll, look, I'll look it up and send it to you. Um, I want to say the tower stopped. They stopped using the tower when the siding was reconfigured, uh, circa 1938. But I'll look it up. Okay, we had 39. So yeah, that would, all right. Yeah. That would be okay. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, again, if you have any questions, shoot them my way or check us out on Facebook. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Well, there's nothing like seeing it in person, though. If you get a chance to drive by, it, it, the impression um, is, is incredible. No. Thank you. Yeah, if anybody is around on the 3rd, it'll be open that day, December 3rd. And if you can't make it, send us a, an email. We can open it up for you. Cool. All right, Chuck, you're, uh, the stage is yours. Hey, Richie, I can't start the video. It won't. Uh... Uh, it's not letting you share the screen. It's, it's, I'm done sharing, right? I'm because the, the host has stopped it. That's why. Uh... Well, while you go, try now. Okay. Try now. Nope. Hmm. If I try to share the screen, let's, you know, do it that way and see what happens. Yeah, try to share. There you go. Oh, okay. Your screen's up. We have imagery. Hang on. Let me move to the where I want to be. Maximize that. There you go. All right, you're okay. perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Richie, Mike, Keith. And I think it's, I'm trying to think the last time I presented before Tri-State, I'm thinking it was probably 2018, uh, but I'm guessing it could have been as early as 2017. And a, a number of things have changed since then. I know we were at the Morris Museum, but uh, the the situation with the cutoff has changed dramatically since that time. Although we were talking about lots of the stuff that might happen. Um, well, it looks like it might happen. So um, we'll be talking about Port Morris to Slateford, but of course we're talking about the entire railroad here from not only Hoboken, but New York to, to Scranton. So the, Presentation is divided into two parts, although not necessarily of equal 
size, the first hundred years, which I'll refer to as being about the old Lackawanna cutoff, and then the second hundred years, if any of us are still around in the year 2111, um, we'll be talking about the new Lackawanna cutoff. So I'll, I'm going to briefly talk about myself, how I got into this with the cutoff. I'm going to talk about the cutoff itself, the history, why it was built, the history of it throughout the up until the time that New Jersey Transit becomes involved. Talk about the construction. We'll do a quote unquote tour of the line and then we'll go through the decades, you know, give a chronology of all that's happened and even into the future. And then we'll talk about the new lack of want to cut off and then do a QA. And I invite you to certainly put questions in the chat. So uh, thanks to Tri State, Pat McKnight at Steamtown, uh, the photographers whose work I borrowed here, and everybody who has supported the cutoff. Uh, effort throughout the years, and uh, my wife Kathy, my daughter Larissa, who's also a videographer for my video series on the cutoff, and also my son Logan. So my story. Uh, this is my dog Shannon on uh, Morristown line in the back of the house. This house sits, you know, this is about as close as you could possibly get to the the tracks behind here. That track, uh, that train is on the. Uh, track three so it's not even the closest that a train could get i mean so i grew up and i think either you if you grew up in a house this close to the railroad either you hate it or love it so um fortunately i, I loved it but um I, I guess not everybody would necessarily gravitate towards something that's really this close to your to where you live uh, my next door neighbor lived next to the tracks as well, and, and uh, he was a retired conductor for the Lackawanna, my, Martin Breitzbecker, and he and his wife, Carrie, took me on the Phoebe Snow. It was 1960, so I'm three and a half at the time, very young, and um, I remember bits and pieces of the trip. Uh, I remember just a sense of being high up, you know, as a, you get a sense of, of being in a low-flying plane, very low-flying plane, as a matter of fact, but still. Probably at this point, the, the, uh, the Pequest Phil, I know it, during, over the cutoff, uh, we had gone into the Tavern Lounge and I was having a, a Shirley Temple, if I recall, at this point. We went to East Stroudsburg, turned around, went on another train home. And on the way back, I remember, it, it, not on the way out, westbound, but eastbound, uh, Mr. Breitzbacker pointing out Roseville Tunnel. And then a whole bunch of time, a lot of things go by, quarter century, literally. And uh, even though I'm kind of watching what's going on with the cutoff, I'm not involved. And then um, I become involved. And it started with the North Jersey Rail Commuter Association. And here we are at Hoboken Festival back in, I want to say either 87 or 88. That's Don Barnacle uh, up front there. And you can see our map for the, the cutoff. And here we are in 89 in Blairstown, a group of us, uh, Fred Words to my immediate right, uh, Maurice uh, Lewis, and then um, the, uh, who would have been the, the head of the Monroe County Railroad Authority, Larry Wills at that point, chairman. And then skipping ahead, in the last, um, well, I guess we're starting our eighth calendar year now with the Lackawanna cutoff videos um, on YouTube, I've been doing that. So that's uh, become a part-time job. I'm retired, so it's uh, that's the only part-time job I have. So the question is, why was the, the cutoff built? And that question actually goes back as far as really the, the Lackawanna itself, even before the Lackawanna to some extent. But most importantly, the, the person who had the most influence on the building of the cutoff was President William Truesdale of the Lackawanna. He takes over in 1899 and immediately, I think, would figure out that there are problems in Northwest New Jersey, specifically Oxford Tunnel, which it, by 1901 has been gauntleted, which means essentially a, a single track. The, the line which you see down here, the old road, at least the, the, the lower two arrows point to the Warren Railroad, which was really intended to be the Lackawanna's connection into New York City, 
to Elizabeth Port over the CNJ. And in fact, there was a merger which took place, lasted only about a year. Lackawanna gets out of it. It won a control of its, I'll say, its inner mileage you know, in New Jersey. So it leases the Morris and Essex and adds that other yellow arrow to the right. And But in doing so and going up to what will in the future from then on uh, be Port Morris Junction, creates a circuitous route. Uh, but the circuitousness is just one problem. The, there are two tunnels. Oxford Tunnel is the worst of the two. Um, but the, the two tunnels collectively um, really make this route inferior, and it's something that has to be replaced. But it doesn't happen immediately. See Oxford Tunnel in the modern era. So starting around 1906, um, 1905, I think even, uh, they, they start surveying routes. And by September 1st of 1906, they have the final route, which, which is far above there, the, the final as built version of the cutoff. But they looked at a number of different routes and they even looked at upgrading the original old road as it would become known as, and uh, they rejected that out of hand. They even looked at an airline, which would have been much more expensive, but would have been interesting how they would have done that. But they, they once again, they rejected because of the cost. And I have to do a presentation or a, a video on this. The most popular one, I've, uh, by the way, of, uh, of all the videos I've done. So let's talk about the old Lackawanna cutoff. And you see the going from right to left, east to west. Uh, three stations, a um, number of different things, Lake Lackawanna, Peak West Phil, Roswell Tunnel, of course. At the west end, you have the two viaducts, and then Slate for Junction, just before the Delaware Water Gap. So the cutoff over the years is, or at least the, what the, the Lackawanna and the Erie Lackawanna uh, referred to it as, and even the press in later years, had different names for the cutoff. And make a long story short, it was decided collectively of those who were involved with the effort to call it lack one to cut off just so that there was one name that we would use. And in fact, the lack one itself called it the lack one to cut off. And then at the beginning when DB snow was being used in posters, it was the new lack one to cut off, even though this is, I'm calling it the old lack one to cut off at this point. And then you can see before Photoshop, what they used to make the poster. And that's what the Pequest fill, which was thought to be the largest railroad fill in the world at the time, uh, looks like in real life, at least at that point. So talking about the quote unquote old Lackawanna cutoff, a double track main line with seven sets of sidings. The line would be single tracked in 1958. Port Morris Junction to Slateford Junction, total of 28.45 miles. At its fastest, so to speak, it had a speed limit of 80 miles an hour for passenger service and 60 mile an hour for freight service. We'll be talking about maybe higher speeds with Amtrak, but we'll get to that. Um, and this is westbound during the 40s and the 50s. Most notable is that all permanent structures on the cutoff are made of reinforced concrete. There were four stations, Greendale, Johnsonburg, Blairstown, and I'll refer to Lake Patcong technically as a fourth station because it was totally reconfigured and the new station um, building built because of the cutoff. The three interlocking towers, Port Morris, Greendale, Slateford. Two viaducts, the Paul and Skill, also known as the Hainsburg Viaduct and the Delaware River Viaduct. One tunnel, uh, Roseville at 1,024 feet for now. And then there were zero grade crossings when the, the line was built. So a double track main line. You see, and here's a, this is Hainsburg siding we're looking in. This is, this is still being constructed. So this is uh, April of 1911. And you can see when they built these sidings, there was typically uh, one on each side, the eastbound and the westbound side, although not necessarily uh, uh, as the equal length or at, at the same, you know, parallel to each other, the exact same spot. It's a little strange why they did that, but 
um, they, it, that's that's what they decided to do. In this case, though, that you can see they're lined up. Port Morris Junction, UN Tower, probably 1912, 1913, Lackawanna Limited. This is the opposite end at Slateford. Amazing to think that uh, if you count the tracks, well, there are five tracks technically, one going into the turntable here at uh, right in front of the photographer and two tracks in the old road on the right, Slateford Tower. That's during another pandemic, by the way, that photo was taken of the uh, Spanish flu. Here's uh, Greendale uh, with the double track main line on the right and the siding track, which shifted from left to right or, or eastbound side to westbound side um, in the original configuration, station and tower. You note that there's a signal bridge, but it is not where the signal bridge is in the photos that Keats showed because that it was moved later on when they reconfigured the sidings here. And that's Wolf Corner Road, uh, Wolf's Corner Road that's uh, still has a, a bridge there. That will be removed in 2000, I believe. Or maybe even early. Yeah, I think 2000. Uh, Johnsonburg, I, I uh, point out Armstrong cut in the far distance. We'll talk about that a little bit. Blairstown. It is the only of the three stations, it was the only one with a separate freight station, albeit a, a tiny or relatively small building. Here's Lake Apacon, which a, a few of you folks got to visit and uh, that wonderfully restored. But most of what is you see here is gone. The the walking bridge, the, the pedestrian bridge is gone. The the uh, like elevator or dumb waiter, I'm not really sure what to call it, but that is all gone. And of course the Morris Canal is, is long gone. Haynesburg Viaduct, Delaware River Viaduct, Roswell Tunnel, eastbound train, be probably just before the, the, uh, the Phoebe Snow, uh, this is probably the Lake um, Lackawanna Limited still has a is a diesel. And this is a future grade crossing that will be here. We'll show you photos of that. Uh, this is at Brooklyn Road, uh, County Road 602 in the Stanhope of Hakong border, just west of Port Morris. So the Lackawanna, um, it, the, the Pennsylvania cutoff didn't use reinforced concrete to the extent that the New Jersey cutoff did, but the, certainly the, the, the cutoff in New Jersey used it almost, almost exclusively on underpasses, which there was uh, lots of flack uh, by local folks in Sussex and Lawrence counties because they didn't feel that these underpasses were wide enough. Here's the Mr. Bunnell trying to capture a photo which quote unquote proves that the that the underpasses are wide enough for a big hay wagon and a and a car. Yeah, this is molasses junction in Vale. See another underpass there. All these buildings are gone except maybe one of the buildings on the far left. It's not clear. I've talked to the folks there and they're not really sure that any of those are the original buildings. There is a building over there, but a house, but it may not be any of these. Stark Road. This is in uh, Knowlton Township. We're near the end of uh, you know, the, the cutoff. Speaking of the Morris Canal, this is the only bridge on the cutoff, the only structure on the cutoff that was not made entirely of concrete. And the reason being is that the Lackawanna anticipated that it would have to tear it out when the um, when the the the, uh, the canal was eventually abandoned, which it was in 1924, and was filled in. So what you see where the arrows are pointing is what you um, point see where the arrows are pointing there. It's uh, basically the same thing. Although the arrows are slightly out of uh, alignment, I'm afraid. Okay, construction. 
Construction runs from August 1st in 1908 to technically December 23rd, 1911, although I'd say most of the construction was done by, um, by October of 1911. Seven sections and contractors, the length and, and the amount of work in each section varied. It was originally projected to open at in August of 1911, which would have been a three-year project, but it actually ended up taking an extra five months with the problems on section three, specifically delays at Roswell Tunnel on, on the Pequest fill. So it's 28.45 miles of new right-of-way, roughly about 66 miles of track if you use the double track and all the siding track. In effect, the, the old road creates extra capacity for the cutoff and is used as a, I'll almost call it like a, a circuitous siding to provide extra um, capacity, particularly since you're going up a grade. Uh, that's, it's often thought that the cutoff is flat, but it is not. We'll, we'll talk about that. And President Tuesdale had, in, apparently because he had thought that the, the cutoff was going to be open by the beginning of, um, of August, takes a trip in August. And I don't think he comes back until late September. He's away for a very, very long time. Uh, this is 1911, of course, we're talking about. Construction involves thousands of workers. Uh, State-of-the-art uh, at that time technique, uh, similar to the Panama Canal, they, there were visitors from other countries who came to look and see what they were doing here. A total of over 15 million cubic yards of fill, about a little over 7 million of those uh, went into the Pequest fill alone. Uh, there's talking about the grade, there's no grade in excess of 0.055%, which is 29 feet per mile but there was a change of about 600 feet or so in elevation. And incidentally, that 0.55 is exactly one quarter of the maximum mainline grade that is, I guess, generally agreed upon or was agreed upon in the US to be the maximum of 2.2%. Of and I always laugh when I see this because it, it, $11 million and you use the, the, the stupid internet converter and it, and it comes out that it says it's the equivalent to 342 million today. You, you, you probably couldn't replace all the track for 342 million today. Um, on the back of a napkin, I, a few years ago, I, I came up with well over a billion dollars, you know, for something like this. And probably with all of just, imagining all the things would have to be done, fill the, the work, the um, eminent domain, all that, if you were to do it today, it, it probably couldn't be done simply, you know, at, at any cost. 12 overhead bridges, 19 road underpasses, two viaducts, four separate rail underpasses, which involve six rail rights of way and one trolley line in Pennsylvania, which crossed over the Slateford Road Bridge two canal undercrossings, both the main line of the cutoff and the Y track, and then a total of uh, 73 concrete structures. So let's do our tour. Okay, and uh, the only difference in this map is that I've added Andover, just so that we know where Andover is, because that's, that's gonna be important. Port Morris. And this is a 1997 aerial photograph. You can see all that is there. Uh, the New Jersey Transit Yard is, I'm not sure it's finished at that point, but it's, uh, you can see where it is in the uh, middle of the Port Morris Yard. Net Kong and then Hackettstown will be well off uh, in the distance. And there's Center Street, uh, the underpass under construction. Uh, and in this later shot, uh, when it's complete, you see the main line and then the Y track at, in the distance. Uh, these two underpasses were unique in their design. You can see the the um, you know the uh, style is is unique. Now there are two different methods that were used to build the cutoff uh, for fills specifically. And this is one of them. This is the so-called trestle method. 
and they used uh, wooden trestles and the little dinky well not too little but the, the the dinky trains would push the cars which i think held like two and a half or three tons of fill and they would dump car by car out onto the trestle and build the fill in that way and i'll show you the other way that they did it in a, in a little bit and and it looks like this house that's in the way it's not going to be lasting too much longer it's like lackawanna this is taken from the uh, the cutoff the cutoff is a scenic line let's we'll just put it that way um and um it will um uh, that's not something that's we're necessarily selling, but it's it's it comes along for the ride. That it's a it is a scenic uh, it'll be a scenic ride along the cutoff. Uh, Wharton Phil, this is looking from the top Roseville Tunnel. It, the decision has not yet at this point. This is May of 1909. The decision to make it a tunnel has not yet been uh, made. Uh, that'll happen later on in 1909. There's a more recent shot. Looking at the uh, the ponds, uh, right pond below, uh, and the distance off to the left will be uh, Wolf Lake, and then further would be Lake Lackawanna. Well, here they are. They're this uh, same day as from above. They 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 have not started the tunnel. Those two tracks off to the right go up a, a right of way that still exists. As a matter of fact, the way you get to the tunnel, if you go to Co Johnson Park. And this is a later shot uh, when the cutoff is in operation. A couple buildings here uh, at Roseville. And you can see that, uh, I'll just back up here, you can see that they they made quite a bit of progress in terms of making a cut. And they stopped. And but so th as a result, the tunnel has a flat top. It's been cut cut down. And there you can see uh, your Lackawanna um, train coming eastbound. On the opposite side of Roseville Tunnel, the West Portal, this is Colby Cut. Uh, this is where lots of work will have to be done in terms of rock fall mitigation. There, there was a rock fall detector system fencing set up that the Lackawanna had and the Erie Lackawanna had, but they're, they're going to go for something I believe something like a netting type of thing that you often see on on highways to keep the the rocks from falling. Here is Andover. Uh, this may not be the Phoebe snow, but it may be the Phoebe snow. Um, you can see off to the right here a culvert, and uh, that's one of the culverts that's going to be replaced as part of the Roseville Tunnel project. And uh, Pequest Phil goes on uh, goes over a couple of railroads. Uh, first one being Sussex Branch of the the Lackawanna itself, and then the Lehigh and Hudson River uh, near Huntsville. Get to the far end of the Pequest Phil, you can see that it's quite an elaborate setup of narrow gauge trackage to. Uh, bring the the fill from the borrow pits. The the railroad bought up 760 acres, which is 1.2 square miles of farmland, and and dug down to anywhere between five and ten feet, and used that to build at least part of the Pequest fill. What wasn't being supplied by rock that was coming from the blasting and and cuts, either Roseville or uh, or perhaps uh, west of the, the Pequest Phil. I'm going to look at this train. This, we're going to spy on these two folks. That are, well, it's actually more than two folks, but the, um, a mom and a dad, apparently. I'm thinking an au pair and a, I'm assuming that's a boy. And it uh, looks like the, 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 the wife is uh, really had it. It's a hot day, probably. Um, don't know that they would have anything resembling air conditioning unless they had ice or something. In the car, but if it's a hot day, you know, you, you could really, you could be really affecting the passengers. So they're out here getting the the breeze. But this date is um, significant, just by coincidence. I had been looking it up, July 11th, 1914. 
same day that this guy, Babe Ruth, makes his major league debut pitching for the Boston Red Sox, and he beat the, the Cleveland Naps. The Naps were supposed to be playing the Yankees tonight. You don't know them as the Naps anymore. They became the Indians, and then this past year became the Guardians. He's talked about Greendale. Johnsonburg. And uh, four stories about Johnsonburg from, from different times. Uh, remember I talked about uh, Armstrong Cut. Well, Armstrong Cut collapses in 1941. And uh, the, the collapse of the, uh, the, the rock wall, if you want to call it that, the cut, uh, closes the cut off for several weeks. Fortunately, the, 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 they had someone who was stationed at the station or possibly at the, uh, the, the freight type of building that, that was there nearby. And he, he came out and heard this and he was able to get uh, basically shut the, the line down because um, it would have been a catastrophe for any train to hit this, obviously. You can see that this has been cut back. This is a shot from about 1990, I believe. Now we we'll talk about the runaway cement cars. Now that these start at Port Morris, and you're going to say, "Well, what does that have to do with Johnsonburg?" Well, they start. This is uh, uh, August 10th, 1958. They start rolling. I won't get into the the what happened, but the the bottom line is. Uh, cement cars with a caboose on the, what would be the front end, the westbound end, starts rolling westbound on the cutoff. When it gets to Greendale, there, those those cars are heading for the the front of the freight NE4, which is going eastbound on the same track. By it's believed by single uh, signal indication, and this is a story from Bob Bars, who's done a lot of research on this particular runaway. It's about 6.30 a.m. on that day. Um, believe by signal indication or the radio or they, they see the, the cars coming out that we don't know exactly. Um, the, the freight, I'll say, dives into the, the, the siding at Greendale and gets out of the way just in time. The two cabooses hit, the, the caboose on the runway and the caboose of the train going into the siding hit but the just the markers are the only only casualty of what could have been the catastrophic uh, collision with the cement cars probably doing at least 60 miles an hour at this point they think they were hitting 80 by the time they went across to delaware and this is bob telling a story in one of my videos where i interviewed him and uh, john sabatka but Jerry Cruz was actually, he was, I think, seven or eight at the time, and he's at the creamery in Johnsonburg. He sees the runaway uh, string of, of cars go past, and then he sees the RS3 chasing it as fast as it possibly could behind it. He said it was several minutes, though, behind it. It, it never caught up, and those cars ended up in the, the Delaware. Now, uh, this uh, the story about Charlie Rydell, uh, who was at one time the longest serving mayor in the state of New Jersey, oh, I think over 40 years at that point. And he was a big supporter in the, back in the 1980s when we needed, we didn't have a whole lot of supporters. And uh, he, he played a, a key role, especially in, in Warren County, where we really needed the support. But the, the question came up, why was he such a big supporter? And I, I, I couldn't figure it out. But I mean, I was grateful for his support, but why? And then one day he he, um, he had me come over to his his farm and he took me around. He, he, actually, we toured the whole area, but we finally went over to the cutoff, which bisected his farm. And he told the story from 1924 where they had a fire, unbeknownst to the family, the 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 family is asleep one night in November 1924, and uh, it, it was right after his mother had died. So it, it, it was this bad circumstance. Well, the, the a, a outbuilding next to the farmhouse catches fire. A westbound freight on the cutoff 
the the engineer stops the train they see the they see the fire they, they, in fact they know the family because they there are lots of interaction between them because they had this was a siding here as well that the four track siding or two tracks of main line and two tracks of siding so they knew the family they stopped the train both the engineer and the uh, firemen run to the house one waits the family the other one tries to put the fire out and they they put the fire out they save they save the building um and potentially even save the house and maybe even save the family so th that i think explains why mayor rydell uh, was was a big supporter he had a, a real soft spot for the the railroad and talking about johnsonburg yes it's it's no more unfortunately uh, there, there, there are two versions of the story. One that it was purposely taken down, and the other version that it was taken down by accident. It, it, but it's a moot point. It, it came down no matter what. It was a problem, though. They were parties in there, and there was a um, an attractive nuisance to uh, uh, use uh, Keats' terminology. Uh, Blairstown, uh, just towards the end of uh, the Lackawanna, before it would come to here, Lackawanna. This is the other method the, of building fills on the cutoff. This is so-called cable tower method. And you see the towers and you see the cables, and the, these would stretch out over the a valley. Um, they, they, I guess there were different situations where one, you know, the trestle method made more sense and where the cable method made more sense. In this particular case, you have this wide valley it, it, it made sense to use the cable method but basically everything else is the same the the train backs up and and dumps the fill out onto the uh, uh, as they build the fill almost go viaduct under construction this is the uh, what will become tunnel field in Knowlton Township route 94 on the left and a tunnel a connector between um the, the two fields, but in, at this point, and I want to say it was the South Mountain in Boston, but it was, I guess, a subsidiary or some, um, part of the Lehigh New England, and they were going to build their own right-of-way, more or less parallel to the New York Susquehanna Western, which over which they had trackage rights, and they was going to join up with the existing LNNE and &E right-of-way, no, not even a mile south at this point. We're looking south here. But that never materializes. And for years, this tunnel is uh, vacant until Green Acres comes along and they get money and the township is able to turn into a soccer and baseball field um, that's uh, used to this day. And it would be that the facility would be useless without that tunnel. And we see the uh, sidings again. And just not too far west of there is this. We're looking towards the water gap. And this is today's Simpson Road, uh, looking the opposite direction now towards McDonald's and exit four on Route 80. Speaking of which, there's uh, Delaware River Viaduct under construction and with I-80 underneath. The river viaduct began. It's basically complete almost at this point, um, in, in beginning in 1911. You see a shot in 1911 looking towards the water gap. And then basically the same shot. I took this uh, 108 years later. And the arrow points to the um, it's over there's even 50 or 55 miles an hour curve, which is the sharpest curve on the cutoff. All the curves were 70 miles an hour or more, but this one, um, because of the configuration of the, the bridge going over the, and, the, and just basically no room to, uh, expand to a, a, a much uh, less sharp curve that you end up with, um, a three and a half degree curve which might have been eliminated had they built another cutoff, which was supposed to connect to this one, which would have tunneled under point of gap and um, gone a totally different alignment into gravel place, but that, that didn't happen. 
and there actually was a graveyard which the cutoff uh, went through and several graves of uh, graves were uh, had to be reinterred in a cemetery which is about a mile away in, in Portland. And there you see steam tripping uh, Slaford. Okay, so let's do the chronology. So um, before 1906, the, the cutoff, the ownership of the cutoff is with um, a whole bunch of different landowners. Then it's the Lackawanna, then the Erie Lackawanna, Conrail, Jerry Turco and Burton Coldmeyer, we'll talk about them. And then the New Jersey Department of Transportation in New Jersey, and then the Pennsylvania Northeast Regional Railroad Authority for the short piece in Pennsylvania are the owners, the present owners. So pre-1906, don't have any pre-1906 pictures, but this is kind of what it looked like. That they're, they're, The Pequest fill will be where, almost where the, the photographer is standing, maybe a little off to the right here, but maybe not, maybe straight through here. We're looking towards what is or will be the Andover station stop, which is up on this hill where you can see they're cutting, but they won't, I think they're pretty much if cut as far down as they're going to go. So this is kind of what it looked like before they they started uh, putting the right of way together, either cutting or or filling in this case. So let's go nineteen teens, and the nineteen teens really start with this is just before President Truesdale, who is the second from the right, um, is just about to leave for his trip four days after this maybe five days, I guess. It was right after the uh, this inspection trip uh, on the Sussex branch, because this is the way they, the closest they could get to the cutoff. But he's there to control the, the folks in section three to keep moving. And then he, he uh, disappears for the better part of two months over in Europe. So in the 15th of December, 1911, they actually run a trip that unfortunately no photos that I've ever been able to see uh, but uh, the, the New York Times does mention an airline um, route that was uh, going to cost $17 million uh, versus the $11 million. It doesn't sound like a lot, but that's uh, about another, well, it's almost uh, half again as much to build that as would have been the, the alignment that was built. And you can see the comparisons that were, that were handed out to the, the old road and the, uh, the cutoff. And the first uh, timetable included the story of the cutoff. And you see down below uh, that, well, this is the, uh, the, the gradient profile of the, the cutoff. And you see all the sidings down below. And you can see that, that not all of them match up, um, you know, foot, I'll say foot per foot, but, you know, where they didn't necessarily have them of equal length or exactly aligned with each other on the eastbound and westbound side. They must have had their reasons for that. Okay, through the 19th teens, uh, the line officially opens uh, Christmas Eve of 1911. Uh, most food trains are divided, diverted from the old road. Uh, the railroad tests out the three stations, originally called Greensville, Johnsonburg, and Blairstown, um, but gives no preference uh, but also test out long 200 car freights, which are a disaster. 1916, Greensville is renamed Greendale. Um, the World War I results in the nationalization of railroads and the maintenance on, uh, no, not just the cutoff, but the uh, railroad in general suffers. And there's no official speed limit at, the, at this point in time. 1920, this is the Rockport wreck. So the family auto starts to seriously compete with rail, uh, at least um, uh, not for necessarily long trips, but certainly for relatively short trips. They do get a speed limit, 70 miles an hour is established on the cutoff. Uh, the Rockport wreck because it happens because a charter train from Chicago is rerouted from the cutoff onto the old road and uh, wrecks after a storm at Rockport um, at Hazen Road, just south of, south of uh, Hackettstown and uh, kills a, a total of 50 persons. Um, 
they're, they're st- the, the railroad starts to favor Blairstown. It starts to figure out that Blairstown is probably its preferred station on the cutoff. And then the, the Roaring Twenties are going to end in a, a crash. So we move to the 30s. Great Depression greatly affects the railroad industry. The less than carload facility at Port Morris closes. I want to say like 32, 33, somewhere in there. Uh, Roseville and Johnsonburg sidings are removed. Roseville siding was only a few miles west of John, uh, of, um, of Port Morris, rather. It wasn't at Roseville Tunnel, but they called it that it, it just because I guess it was close enough to Roseville and they called it that. Uh, Greendale Tower closes. There are some dispute about when exactly it closes, but it closes during the 1930s. Uh, the railroad experiments with the, the rocket, which is a, um, a train on a fast schedule, and then the speed limit of the cutoff is raised to 75. 1940s. Uh, freight and passenger traffic surges during the uh, involvement of the United States in World War II. Greendale becomes basically a freight-only station, and Johnsonburg becomes a passenger train flag stop with very few trains stopping. The, uh, there's the collapse of uh, Armstrong Cut, um, and that uh, diverts trains for uh, two weeks to the old road. Speed limit on the cutoff is then raised to 80 miles an hour. And um, after the war is over, the mainline steam is slowly dieselized. And then uh, streamlined passenger service, the PB Snow, for example, is inaugurated in 1949. We go into the 50s. Uh, this is technically, I think, uh, this might be Route 611 at this point. It's Route 80 today, but at that point, it was a different route. This was before Route 80. 50s, Blairstown becomes the only active passenger station remaining on the cutoff, although freight does continue at all the three stations. Uh, Hotshot freights are um, inaugurated. Slateford Tower closes, 51. Hurricane Diane um, devastates the, the railroad, uh, particularly in Pennsylvania, and commuter losses on the New Jersey's suburban lines Cause the Lackawanna to start seeking not only subsidies but a merger partner, and the Lackawanna does um, end up in a merger with the Erie, even though it would have preferred to have merged with the uh, Nickel Plate, which would have been an end-to-end rather than a side-by-side. But it, it didn't work out for various reasons. We talked about the very uh, the the, uh, the runway at uh, Port Morris, and the cut off is single tracked. And here's the. Shot from the beginning of the 50s um, at Haynesburg, the uh, Susquehanna, and uh, hot shot um, freight on the cutoff on the, uh, the viaduct above. Slateford. Um, it's already been, this has already been single track. So this, um, this train is um, on the siding, actually, it's the westbound main, the old westbound main, but it's actually a siding at this point. And the eastbound main um, is actually the the single track that remains on the cutoff at this point after fifty eight. So you train it looking onto Wharton Phil from the top of Roseville Tunnel. Nineteen sixties. DL and W and Erie merge, and the, um, although that in 1960, but the process will drag on into 61. Um, no secret that former Erie management dominates the new railroad, and uh, the Erie Lackawanna moves most of its freight from the Lackawanna side to the Erie side through Port Jervis. DB Snow is discontinued, then revived, and then discontinued again. Uh, little by little, long term, uh, long distance passenger trains are discontinued, and the infamous severing of uh, the Booten line for Interstate 80 near Patterson, uh, Garrett Mountain, is going to come back to haunt uh, the the EL when we get into the the mid 1970s. Here's some back in the 60s, a bunch of students from Blair Academy waiting for a train to Blairstown.
1970s uh, American uh, Freedom Train, Tom Kalsik photo. So the last passenger train on the cutoff, um, the Lake City stops at Blairstown, January 5th, 1970. Uh, EL becomes part of Derrico with the Delaware and Hudson and the Norfolk and Western in the aftermath of Hurricane Agnes's destruction west of Binghamton. Uh, the, the cutoff and the Scranton side in general is, is quiet until about 1974 when virtually all freight traffic is shifted back to the Lackawanna side, which caused a number of challenges, um, not only just on the cutoff, but um, east of the, the cutoff, certainly. And the, uh, the, the tracks through the Roseville Tunnel are shifted to the center to give greater clearance. And there was actually a proposed ramp uh, from Greendale to the Lehigh and Hudson River railway to serve the Erie side to then would have allowed for partial abandonment of the Erie side but that idea never uh, that never happened there wasn't the money to do it and it, it just didn't happen and the EL is converted uh, conveyed into Conrail on April 1st 1976 and uh, Amtrak talk about them Yale Freight, probably NY, I guess one, NY 100, I'm guessing. So, um, UN Tower, model board, why am I showing this? Well, there was a quirk with um, the cutoff after the single tracking. That was that any train that was uh, on the cutoff between East Slateford and West Greendale, um, it would you wouldn't know where it was. You would only knew that it was in there someplace, but it could be any, it could be at West Greendale or anywhere in between there and East Slateford. And uh, Artie Erdman in one of his, uh, in, well, in, he's told in the stories on Facebook, but also in the interview I had when he talks about where the a train is, it's lost in a sense. They don't know where it is. And he ends up calling this guy, uh, Dave Waldron at the, the station in Blairstown, which is at that point a radio station, uh, was sold off uh, after passenger service ended. And uh, during the commercial, um, Dave walked out and saw a headlight and called back to, or however he was maybe still on the phone with Artie, and just, just let him know that oh, yeah, the train's coming, it's coming up the hill. Here's Amtrak. Um, say Bob Yannisey on the left and. Uh, Bill Herkner on the right. This uh, this was run from Hoboken to Scranton. See a shot at Greendale from the, the front of the train. Mike Wickman, talking about Mike, Mike Wickman. And uh, interestingly enough, and this is what uh, um, Keith showed that the upgrade of the cutoff initially by Conrail, which is strange in retrospect, but my 1978 is Conrail is doing the exact opposite and trying to abandon the line to Scranton, actively discouraging freight customers, basically telling them that they're, they're you know, they're, the days are numbered for the service. And uh, the last freight car is delivered to Greendale in 1978. And the last through freight um, occurs in November 1978. And then Port Morris Towers closed, being a 79. There's even reports of sabotage or the signal system thereafter. And then there's the special that is run. And that, that's really the starting point for the 40-year effort to reestablish passenger service on the cutoff. And the 1980s is not really a, uh, it's a sad time. Um, Conrail uh, uh, files for abandonment and, and will eventually get to abandon the, the cutoff. But the counties in, in both New Jersey and Pennsylvania fight to save the line. Morris, Sussex, and Warren in New Jersey, Monroe, and Lackawanna in Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, the track on the cutoff is removed during the summer of 1984. Um, but some other things that are positive actually will occur, like Steamtown comes to Scranton in 1984 as well. Um, and the rail from Slateford to Scranton is actually saved. Uh, that's 60 miles. And that'll be a, a, a big backbone to the, the Amtrak service. And uh, the, the cutoff right away sold to two different developers in 1986. See so the removal at Greendale taking place. Uh, 
And this is what the right of way looked like at Roseville back in the late 80s. Or West Port Morris, where the two tracks came together, to, where it went from double to single track. And uh, this is from the Pennsylvania side, looking towards New Jersey on the Delaware River Viaduct. Um, the, the track over there in Pennsylvania lasted a little bit longer, but it, it started disappearing in, uh, I want to say, late 80s. And this guy, this is Jerry Turco. It's not really Jerry Turco, but it's about as the only pic, only photo I've ever seen that even looks close to Jerry Turco. He doesn't, there's no pictures of Jerry Turco I've ever seen, but this looks very much like him. So he threatens to destroy the cutoff by selling off fill and dumping debris into the cuts on the on the line. Burton Goldmeyer says that he wants to use his short section. He only got like a mile and a half uh, between uh, what will be a grade crossing in uh, Hopatcong and, and Port Morris. He wants to use it as an access road. Turco owns the rest of the line all the way into Pennsylvania, by the way. And that's when the effort to have the state of New Jersey acquire the cutoff, and that's when that begins. And in, in fact, the 1989 bond issue on the ballot was approved by the voters in New Jersey and provided $25 million for the acquisition, acquisition of railroad rights away. And basically, all of that went to the cutoff. And here we are again, uh, we're, we're promoting that uh, over the air in, in Blairstown. And here's the uh, results of that, uh, that vote. Um, it almost didn't happen for the, the 25 million that was almost taken out. It was 90 million for the um for the bridges and 25 for the rights of way. And that provision for the 25 million almost came out. Almost. Um and there was two different commissions uh, that looked at the state railroad uh museum. Uh there was one in the late 80s and then another one in, in the uh, late 90s. This is the one in the 80s. That's Tom Gagliano up front, who later became executive director of New Jersey Transit for a while. And there's my Mayor Rydell again off to the left. We're talking about the 90s. This is that grade crossing. So eminent domain proceedings begin against both Turco and Goldmeyer. Uh, the grade crossings are created at, at both County Road 602 and a pack on which we just saw, and then County Road 611 at Greendale, and then Slateford Road in Pennsylvania, that bridge is actually torn down and filled in. So that's the only blockage for the whole right-of-way um, on the cutoff. So in 1995, the National Park Service takes over the operation of Steamtown. 97, Amber Mills, a major flower producing operation opens at Mount Pocono. And then there's snags in the condemnation process, including the exhaustion of the 25 million that delays the cutoff acquisition by New Jersey DOT. And here's that grade crossing under construction. You can see the old road, which went underneath the, the cutoff on uh, uh, hairpin turns and then uh, I think it was maybe eight or nine feet clearance. And there you can see what it looks like. And you can see the cutoff crosses a grade now. And there's the, uh, the original bridge at Slateford. Uh, that where the trolley line will eventually go over uh, shortly after this opens. And then that was replaced by fill. And you can see they didn't bother to take the tracks away. They filled over the tracks. The 2000s, here they saving bridges, so that was a, an important thing. Unlike for that one bridge, which did come down, and this is Blairstown. So the, the cutoff is acquired in 2001, finally. The orphan bridges that uh, 521, which, which we just saw in, in Blairstown, and then 605 in Byram are preserved. A uh, federal environmental assessment in 2009 re results in a FONSI finding of no significant impact, and that opens the door to federal funding uh, for the uh, Andover section, the minimum operating segment uh, that's 7.3 miles long, which is now under, finally going to be under construction again after 10 years. Uh, so the federal funds are approved for the Andover service using toll credits to uh, provide matching funds from New Jersey. It's because of a federal project. You have to have both federal and state match. Uh, $24 million is approved for Roseville Tunnel at that point, and that makes it a $62 million total project at that point. 
And uh, then there's the Indiana bat, which is kind of a complication in terms of clearing during the, the warmer months. Not a problem in the colder months, fortunately. Okay, here's uh, that Sparta Stanhope Road, which was uh, opened in 2008. And the old original 11, 1911 bridge is behind it. So the 2000 teens, New Jersey Transit starts up, um, clearing the right of way begins. Um, eight miles of track is delivered by Norfolk Southern in December of 2011. And the New Jersey Transit train becomes the first on the cutoff in 27 years. And this is John Wooliver. Uh, we, we met and uh, uh, celebrated the 100th anniversary of the cutoff on December 24th, 2011. So the new Lackawanna cutoff, I'll call it because now it's the New Jersey Transit project to rebuild the line, Port Morris to Andover. The arrow points to Port Morris, Andover, 7.3 miles. I've divided into phases, and 1A is the short time in which New Jersey Transit was doing its work. And they during that time, they laid four miles of track, roughly, um, although in three disconnected sections. Um, and then the environmental issues pop up. There were wetlands, which had to be mitigated and offset, and then Hudson Farm culvert, which is really the big delay, which uh, stops work for, well, collectively almost 10 years together, but uh, Hudson Farm, probably almost seven years, maybe even eight years of that is because of that. Um, Rosal Tunnel is ready finally for rehabilitation. And the, in Pennsylvania, the Delaware Lackawanna is highly successful. So there's this map again, Port Morris, Slateford. See the, uh, the project there, clearing the right of way. They um, uh, laid the track down, the concrete ties continues well to rail. Here's the, the rail train comes in, uh, delivered by Norfolk Southern, but New Jersey Transit is pushing it back onto the, the cutoff, taking the, uh, the track off of the rail train, which ironically, the last train before this was a rail train taking up the track. See, this is uh, New Jersey Transit is parked all the way you know, back. And you can see all the track here that's been laid out. Uh, some of which has already been moved out into the cutoff, but there's still still quite a bit there. See how they had to bring the, the concrete ties. This is a distance this is several miles west of Port Morris. And they had this uh, uh, front loader or whatever you would call it, uh, like a forklift type of thing, uh, delivering the ties and actually having to drive out back and forth. And this is the end of the track presently at Lake Lackawanna. And this is the beginning of the concrete ties at Port Morris. So phase 1B is the 10 years uh, from March of 2012 to this April of 2022. And Hudson Farm is the, the big delay over this culvert, this pipe. You can see the pipe down below. That's been the big holdup. Uh, this, there, there was a, some sort of analysis that was done by the Department of Environmental Protection. And they determined that this pipe might fail during a 100-year flood, and therefore it had to be replaced. And we're 500 feet upstream from the cutoff at this point. We're not on the cutoff. So this is a bizarre, um, basically, requirement for this to be done. But it, it held up the cutoff for, well, over seven years. And um, during this time, the Alp 44s have been parked on the cutoff, and then Earlier, you saw the uh, the Arrow three cars that were parked there too. They 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 left early early on, but the Alps are still there. <clears throat> and uh, some of my videos and uh, interesting uh, the quote from Larry Molsky about the the rail line was dead just about. It was only resuscitated at the last moment. Another video which I do the update on the uh, the tunnel. And the most recent one that I've done is a, a, a drone trip over the entire 7.3 miles from Port Morris to um, Andover, actually a little bit further uh, beyond Andover. Well, it's Andover, basically Route 206. So in the 2020s, Amtrak announces plans for the Scranton New York City service. That's August of 2020. 
environmental issues are finally, finally resolved. Um, and just literally two months ago now, and New Jersey Transit work on Port Morris to Andover um, resumes, um, resuming the form of uh, surveying at this point, but to, it, it, it's just a matter of time uh, where we're going to actually see physical work for the first time in you know, a whole, literally a whole decade. And then 1C will be, is basically, well, now that this is, this culvert thing has been resolved and this is the Hudson Farm culvert. It actually goes under this driveway. And um, you can see that there was going underneath the barn and the barn is now gone after, you know, shortly after the photo, I, the first photo was taken. So this is Roseville Road in, in Andover Township. So what's the Roseville Tunnel Project involved? Uh, it was approved by the New Jersey, um, New Jersey Transit Board of Directors um, April 13th of 2020, 32 and a half million. Uh, the tunnel and the two culverts, the one at Hudson Farm and the one at uh, Andover Station where we saw the Phoebe Snow or uh, westbound Lackawanna train. It will be a two-year project plus 30 days. So that basically it has to be done before October 1st, roughly of 2024. They're going to remove 15 to 20 feet of the tunnel. So it will be under a thousand feet. And they'll also increase the clearance, lateral and vertical. They'll line the tunnel, waterproof it, reestablish drainage dishes, ditches, uh, install a communication system, which will be compatible with the uh, positive train control. There'll be rock full mitigation, as I mentioned. It'll be about 1,700 feet west of Colby Cat and a, and a couple hundred feet east. It'll be clearing all the way to Andover, which is roughly 8,000 feet. And um, I can't see what the bottom uh, slide, bottom of the slide is because it's blocked by my, uh, my toolbar here, but um, you can read it and I can't. So, but we'll move on. So, um, you're not going to probably see this again uh, with Roseville Tunnel. This is going to be a thing of the past. And uh, Mike was talking about, he, he's here in the middle of the photo. Um, this is uh, Congressman Gottheimer back in April. And the folks from Andover who really, really worked hard over a number of years, even um, uh, They've uh, committed $115,000 out of their open space fund so that the, the culvert could be done just to get this project going again. So they did, you know, they've really done a, a great job. And that, those are the, the three members of the, uh, the committee that were there. And the, the man on the far right with the white hair is Tom Walsh. No relation, but uh, we joke about that. But uh, he, he's the mayor of Andover Township. So what about Amtrak? Well, phase two. Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration Amtrak have sponsored the project um, um, from the infrastructure bill, which provides billions of dollars for new starts across the United States. One of them proposed is New York City to Scranton. Uh, there would be three round trips a day, uh, roughly three hours and 25 minutes, uh, mirroring the Phoebe Snow's Hoboken to Scranton schedule. Um, it would re involved relaying 21 miles of track and the cutoff, the part which uh, New Jersey Transit wouldn't be doing, and that's Andover to Slateford. Uh, east of Andover, anticipating 70, 80 mile an hour of uh, travel. West of Andover, being told it, it could be as high as 100 to 110, which would be class six FRA track. Um, part of the project would be to re rehabilitate the two viaducts, upgrade the track in Pennsylvania, Speed limits will vary due to the curvature and uh, the grades. Um, they're anticipating top speeds, maybe 80 mile an hour, maybe 90, I've heard. Of course, then uh, PTC will be needed. Stations uh, will be in New York and New Jersey, New York Penn, Newark Broad Street, Summit, Morristown, Dover, Blairstown, and in Pennsylvania, East Stroudsburg, Mount Pocono, also known as Margaritaville, Toby Hanna, Scranton, and uh, this is the most up-to-date that the FR will be accepting applications from the 39 corridors which have been designated. Now, whether all 39 will apply, that's a different story, but they will be allowed to uh, apply starting in December of this year. 
And the FRA expects to announce a short list or a priority list of projects in either January or February of this coming year in 2023. Pennsylvania Northeast Regional Railroad Authority and Amtrak are doing a study, which is ongoing and would be submitted, presumably, in that application to the FRA. And this is the map you see, uh, which also shows Allentown and Reading service, but you can see Scranton service there from uh, New York to, uh, to Scranton. And here's a um, sort of a, an interesting uh, idea of uh, Amtrak coming through Mountain Station in South Orange, my old stomping grounds. We talk about positive and negatives. Well, negatives, well, cost for relaying the track. I mean, it's going to you know, not be cheap. Um, and there's also going to be upgrading Pennsylvania trackage. Yes, it can be argued there hasn't been a train uh, over this line or a, a passenger revenue passenger train over this line in a half a century. And you do have the Pocono grades and the curves that will add time to the schedule. And um, it will require that the states match um, money to the federal funding, uh, probably 20 percent, we believe. And uh, so you know that's going to be money that's going to have to be obtained. Positives, well, um, and uh, Mike mentions this, it's um, one of only two proposed Amtrak projects out of the 39 that does not involve a class one freight railroad. It would be all publicly owned right of way. Amtrak, New Jersey DOT, New Jersey, New Jersey Transit, and the uh, Panera, as they call it, PNRRA. It's the only rail route parallel to I-80, 280, and 380, and one of the most heavily traveled corridors in the U.S., has potential for significant ridership, economic benefit to and from North Jersey, Northeastern Pennsylvania, the Poconos, and New York City. And there you see the ownership. The Pennsylvania Northeast Regional Railroad Authority owns the trackage in, in Pennsylvania. The cutoff is, is publicly owned by DOT, and east of there is New Jersey Transit. And then there's a few miles that's actually owned by Amtrak because the, the, the line would actually involve running over the Northeast Corridor. And we might someday see this. We'll see. And maybe even this. You never know. And phase three, well, could we go beyond Scranton? Well, that's, you know, maybe stretching things right now, but it's it's been talked about. Um, Binghamton, Syracuse, Southern Tier, don't know. We'll see. You know, that that's definitely something um, we're talking, you know, years away now at this point. But you might, you know, never know. You might see Amtrak over Tunkhannock. I mean, revenue Amtrak over Tunkhannock at some point. And uh, I'll just do a pitch for my videos. This is one that's coming up. Uh, will be released in the next few days, hopefully. Uh, that's that. This is also part of that video. And uh, I'll do another pitch, you know, uh, for the the Black One Cutoff Historical Committee on Facebook. Uh, feel free. We love to have you. And I just want to thank the group. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you, thank Chuck. You, Chuck. And, uh, and again, I still, I, I still can't start my video, so you can't see what I look like. So maybe this is as well. But. <laughs> well, there are pictures of you in there. Okay. But once again, it's a it's such a complete explanation of everything. Um, it's hard to think of any questions. You know that. Well, if the, if there aren't any questions, I'm fine with that. But if you know, <laughs> did we get any, or did we um, did I um, face it? I've answered uh, a few. But uh, there's one question that says the LMHR underpass under the cutoff was what was that wide enough for two tracks? I think it was um, because if it, if you look at the photo and I'd have to go back, you know, to because it's pretty close to the beginning of the presentation, it's um, the one track that was that, that they had was on one side of the tunnel, so I suspect that that they. I believe they might have left room for sufficient room for a second track. Now, it, you know, you're probably not going to, you're not going to get double stacks through there, but uh, of course, nobody's talking about rail service on the LNHR, but back in the day, um, probably, yeah, they probably, it was a, they, they left room for a second track. 
And that that tunnel actually is a pain in the neck in terms of the, them trying to react, uh, create a, a, a trail because the the owner there has been obstinate about being um, uncooperative. And I'll just leave it at that. So they that that's a break in the trail on on that particular right of way for the time being. Yeah, okay. interesting. Interestingly, in that tunnel, the, uh, the the cement, the wooden forms that form the culvert were laying alongside there for forever. And there's the, the, the hardware is still there, but the wood is completely rotted right now. But um, hmm. Hmm. interesting. We had a question come in. Are there any projections on number of passengers uh, that might use the corridor? Not yet. Them? No, I haven't seen anything. And um, Amtrak. Um, Presumably, we'll have those. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I can't believe that if they're doing uh, an analysis and a study, as it were, uh, that they won't have that. Um, but I have not seen anything that has been publicly released at this point. Okay. I had another question come in. What is supposed to be the purpose of the walkway in the Roosevelt Tunnel? I don't know. I mean, it would be a pedestrian walkway. I don't know if they're anticipating that they're going to be ATVers that are going to go through there. I, I can't imagine that that's a, um, you know, a, going to be a welcoming card to them. Uh, I suspect maybe for inspections and such. I, I, I really don't know. And they're going to have um, uh, TV cameras all over the place, or probably, and lighting and such. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's just kind of a standard type of thing that they do. Um, and okay. um, I mean, there will be room for a second track, but they, um, I, I presume that the, 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 the right of way for the whatever track they don't use, you know, whatever right of way they don't use, um, you know, will be where the walkway is. If the, uh, if Amtrak gets in full swing, I could see a need for a second track while NJ Transit has trains waiting at the station. And haven't seen transit plans for any kind of coach yard, which means they'll probably stage that stuff out of Port Morris anyway. I I believe they probably will go out of Port Morris. They they are going to extend the track a little bit beyond and um, Andover, about a thousand feet, not quite to um, Route two hundred six. So they could park at least one train, I guess. There maybe it, I don't know. They would get two, but. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, in terms of sightings, I, 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 I can't imagine that they're going to go for double tracking for any significant distance, but they're, they're going to definitely have to be sightings along the route. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that. Right. And one, Beyond one, Port Morris. Correct. And then one other benefit of the line is, is I think it will have more colleges on it than any other small short corridor. Uh, between Scranton, East Stroudsburg, St. Elizabeth, Newark College Engineering, Rutgers Law, Newark, and, and Seton, uh, Hall. Seton Hall, and, and yeah. uh, you know, uh, Stevens and Hoboken, and, and, the, and, yeah, the, Ivory no, no, no. and the Ivory yeah, League. There's no, so. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And, and of course, there, there are other schools as well. You saw Blair Academy, for example. Um, right. You know, that's interesting there that the... Um, um, yeah, it's it's one of those things that you, you don't think about until you get to the point where you this becomes real and you start thinking, well, where, where are other potential sources of uh, ridership? Because um, there are lots of people who don't use cars or, you know, they don't have ready, ready access to cars or they don't want to use their cars. You know, that's well, another thing. It's it, in the, the people living in the dormitories, the, the kids, they'll be going home weekends more often now. And remember that the Erie Lackawanna kept those trains on past the holidays specifically for the for the college kids, for Elmira and Syracuse kids to get home, get back to school for the holidays. And then they took the trains off on January 5th. You know, so. Right. Right. A couple more questions come in. Uh, have there any been been any studies in the condition of the two viaducts yes um there was a study that uh was uh, released at the end of 2019 uh this was done uh this was done this was pre-amtrak coming in so the 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 analysis was done on extending the track from 
um, and over to the Water Gap with the station at Water Gap. But they answered the question uh, at that time, they determined that the cost of rehabilitating um, the Hainsburg Viaduct would have been 16 million, one six million, and um, the viaduct over the Delaware was 54 million. So the, collectively, the it was 70 million for the two at that time. And they actually had divers go down and they were looking at the piers and such. So um, we'll see. I mean, but yes, they, they have looked at that. Okay. Uh, is there a current projection for Andover? Um, no. I mean, you, you have the pandemic. You have um, a lot of things working against it. Andover was never intended to be the the the, the whole thing you know it's a, mm -hmm. by definition it's mos a minimal operating segment so therefore it's phase one out of i don't know how many phases we'll see but it was never intended to be anything more than just to start and um yeah i mean it's 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 not the most ideal place to put a station but as it turns out it was the only place that was feasible under the circumstances especially if you're talking about only running a, a, a once again a minimum operating service seven and a half miles basically okay um, another question came in uh, is Roseville tunnel supposed to be lined all the way through yes yes and i'll ask, i'll answer a question that maybe is on people's minds or some people's minds about why didn't they deal why didn't they talk about daylighting the tunnel and actually that was i i believe it might have been proposed at at the beginning when they were looking at the federal funding and the um, SHPO, uh, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office, um, looked at the, well, not only the, the tunnel, but the cutoff and determined that the cutoff was a historic rail corridor and that the tunnel would have to remain a tunnel. So that's the, that's the reason why daylighting the tunnel has never been an option. I know it's been talked about, but it's not an option. It's, it's, it's a mood point. It, so, but, um, but yes, as far as I'm aware, it will be totally lined. So what you see now is, is going to, it's not going to look like that anymore. Gotcha. So get your pictures, get your pictures now. A uh, couple more questions. Any plan to fill the old Brooklyn road underpass? I don't know what they want to do with that. Um, they, it, I I don't know. I mean, they could, but no, I don't. I have not heard anyone mention that they would do anything with that. I mean, in other words, is it uh, structurally sound enough to support trains in its present condition? I, I don't know. That would probably, I would presume, part of the analysis. They 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 looked at the structures back in twenty two two thousand and nine, so that was part of the uh, environmental assessment, but. Um, you know, that's, this is now what, 12, 13 years later. So they may have to redo that. And in fact, they've, they've talked about that. That's one of the things that would have to be probably done, uh, have to be an update, um, which, uh, is another advantage that this particular corridor has that because very few corridors will have the environmental assessment done, even though ours would ours, you know, quote unquote, ours would have to be updated. It, it's been done. So <clears throat> you would think that it's it's not going to be as big a deal. Okay. Um, no, I guess the last question here, is there any plan or, or need um, for any of the old towers with six trains a day of Amtrak and, and JT? <clears throat> no. Okay. No, everything's going to be run. <clears throat> I, I don't know if we run out of. It's a good question as to uh, where it's going to be centrally um, operated, but um, no, uh, there would be. Now, it, historically, you now the question is what would be the use for the towers, and I, I, I'd say at this point I can't answer that. I mean, Greendale, we have looked at it, but you know, for reasons Keith has mentioned, it's not part of our lease. But we, you know, we'd like to uh, possibly restore the the tower, but in terms of its functionality, in terms of operating a railroad, no. They're, they're, you know, th those days are over. You know, you know, that's uh, no more. Okay. Looks well, like that's the last of the questions. Um, all right. 
Well, thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Keith. Um, wonderful presentations. Um, very informative. Um, and we greatly appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Keith. Looking forward to talking soon. Yes, sir. Right. More to come. Yes. Very well, well. I'll have you back next year when there's a bigger, uh, when, there, when there's more news and, and things are more material vis-a-vis -vis Amtrak and NJ Transit. I think it was uh, 750 days after September 1st for the for NJ Transit service to begin. So. Uh, yeah, well, the New Jersey Transit is, I, I didn't include it in the presentation, but they did say they've been holding to 2026 uh, because they would be, they would do the tunnel and then uh, the culverts, but the, the right of way work and the the trackage and such and the grade crossing and so forth that would be done like in 2025 and uh, 2026 presumably but that also coincidentally could fall within the time frame of when amtrak may be finishing if amtrak can hold to the they're saying four years um possibly four from the time of uh, the start with amtrak that's so that's beginning of 2027 if you hold them to it. So that's ambitious, but that's that's what I've heard through the grapevine. And from what I've heard behind the scenes on the Amtrak deal, it's it's looking very good. So nothing's official. Uh, I I'd say it's definitely better than 50-50. Right. Yep. So so our fingers are crossed. Yeah, but, but for those folks who thought they were uh, born too late, maybe not. Maybe not. Right. right. But this is it. If it doesn't happen this time, <laughs> you know. So this. Oh yeah, I mean this 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 is a golden opportunity. I mean there is absolutely no doubt about it. And yeah. um, and and, I, and we encourage everybody to support the politicians of both parties, either party, um, any way you can that that are voting for this. And, and to encourage them to go for it. They need to hear from the public as much as possible. Absolutely. And historically, we have gotten support from both parties. Not always necessarily at the same time, but I mean, it has been, um, it, as long as it's been around, and now we're talking close to 40 years now, it's uh, both parties have been supportive. So right. uh, yes, absolutely. You know, it, we don't want to make this a partisan issue. We want to be, you know, keep it, um, you know, definitely keep it uh, neutral. Yeah, in, in New Jersey, it's mostly the Democrats in charge, and the Democrats are really beating the drum. So keep uh, keep. Yeah, and, and do you want to know something? In the past, it was the Republicans too. I mean, we've. You right. know, I, 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 I'm not. I'm not. You know, basically supporting either. But I'm, I'm just saying is, you know, historically we've been very fortunate in that that it, yep. if it, whoever was it, it seems like for the most part. There are a couple exceptions, but for the most part, the, the folks who have been in positions that could be very helpful to us have been supportive and sometimes yep. extremely supportive. So yep. that's, hey, you can't ask for more than that. Exactly. But, uh, and again, us as advocates, uh, any writing to the newspapers you can do in support of it, any writing to the politicians you can do to support it, they need to hear from the public to make, to, to reassure Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Right thing. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Keith and Chuck again. Um, for those in the audience, our next membership meeting will be on the second Thursday in November, which is November 10th. Uh, we'll have Tom Reynolds giving a presentation on the Raritan River Railroad. Uh, so thanks again, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Good night. See you next time.